Good morning, welcome to Unit 4.1, Exponential Equations. Um, in this topic, we uh, first I want you to recall some properties of exponentials. These are properties you should have seen in Algebra 2 and maybe even in Algebra 1. But the first property is that anything to the zeroth power is going to be equal to 1. Anything to the first power is going to be equal to itself. Then we have our negative exponent properties here that if you have a negative exponent, that simply means that you can um, move it, whether it's from the denominator to the numerator, or the numerator to the denominator, but you move the exponent and its base and you drop the the sign. And so that's what these two down here are saying. Here's the product quotient and power rule. The product rule simply tells me if I'm multiplying um, two bases, that they have to be the same base, but my exponents could be different or the same. It doesn't matter. But if I'm multiplying two things with the same base, then what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to add their uh, exponents. If I'm dividing two things with the same base, then I'm going to subtract their exponents. And if I'm raising um, a based with an exponent to another power, then I'm multiplying those exponents. And finally, down here is our rational root rule, which simply tells me that if I have a base to a fraction exponent, that that is our power over root property, which is the same as saying um, that it is x to the, oops, sorry, x to the x to the top power, like the numerator, and it's the, the root is the denominator. Okay, um, here's our definition of an exponential function, but some examples of what an exponential functions would be and what an exponential function would not be. So examples of an exponential function would be four to the x, um, one third to the x, seven to the negative x. But as all of you, as you can see in all of these examples, the variable is in the exponent. That's what this exponential formula um, has. But let's look at some non-examples here. In this first example, yeah, it's a negative exponent, but my variable is the base. So this is actually a power function. It's part of our polynomials. Same with here, 5 to pi. Pi is a constant, so that is still a polynomial power function. And then um, 1 to the x, well, 1 to any power, 1 to the thousandth is still 1. So unfortunately, our 1 to the x isn't necessarily an exponential. Okay, um, so one of the main things that we're going to talk about in today's lesson is going to be key features. We're going to talk about key features. We're going to talk about transformations. So that's going to be a big part of this, as well as we're going to go into some of the exponential formulas that are standard, um, such as in finance or with exponential growth and decay. So the first thing I want to remind you guys are our key features that we're going to use, domain and range, intercepts, um, which includes our roots and our zeros, some asymptotes, and behavior, increasing, decreasing. So what is is domain and range? Well, domain is our, let me get a laser pointer. Okay. Domain is the, where the function can exist on the X. So as you can see, that's represented here that my domain goes from negative three to one and three is not even included. Whereas my range is where it's included on the Y. So in this function, I'm going from negative four all the way to zero, um, where zero is, is included, is included. Okay. Then we have intercepts. We have y-intercepts, which cross the y-axis. We have x-intercepts, which cross the x-axis, and we call those roots and zeros as well. Uh, we also have asymptotes. Um, we have a, three different kinds. We have a horizontal asymptote, a vertical asymptote. You also know we have oblique asymptotes. Um, but speaking of asymptotes, we also have discontinuities to account for, such as the removable discontinuity or our holes or a jump discontinuity, as well as the vertical or infinite asymptote. And we also have n behavior, which tells me uh, when we use our limit notation, which tells me I'm looking at the limit as x approaches negative infinity. What is my function approaching? And my limit as x approaches positive infinity. What is my function approaching? That is n behavior. An example of that is this graph right here. Um, this is 2 to the x. So it is an exponential function. And its n behavior from the left uh, is, is approaching 0. You can see as it kind of goes down. And it's... Um, and behavior on the right as x goes to positive infinity, well, this function is going to go up and up and up and up and up forever. So that's going to be positive infinity as well. And finally, we have increasing, decreasing. And an increasing function is simply as x increases, so does y, uh, or as x decreases, so does y, or, or whatever. It's a um, directly proportionate uh 
section, sorry, but a decreasing function would be as x increases, y decreases. They are indirectly proportionate. And the biggest confusion I see with these are when we have concavity, when you have curves. So here's a brief example of increasing constant and decreasing. So here you can see as x goes right, so y goes up. As x goes right, y stays constant. So that means that's a constant function. You can also have a constant that's happening vertically as x stays still, y increases. Um, and then finally, you have another increasing right here, but here we have that decreasing. It's a little easy to tell when you have linear lines, but what happens when it's concave, when it has curves? So concavity can have increasing and decreasing. So here we have our smile, our concave up. And as you can see, it's decreasing on this end, but it's increasing here. Here we have the frown, the concave down, and you can see that you have a decreasing section as well as an increasing section. So finally, we're actually going to graph this. And so this um, function, what we're looking at is actually the graph of f of x equals 4 to the x. So that's what we're doing. And we need to describe its domain, its range, its intercepts, asymptotes, and behavior, increasing, decreasing. Well, that seems like a lot to do. But just like with any graph, we're just going to start from the basics. What do we do first when we try to graph a function, we create a table. It's as simple as that. So here's my table already done. So if I took that and I plotted those on a graph, I would actually be able to identify domain, range, intercepts, asymptote, and behavior increasing, decreasing, because now I'd have a graph, a fully functioning graph to work with. So here is that graph plotted and everything. F of, or y, y equals f to the 4 to the x. Sorry, I can't speak this morning. And so what are we trying to figure out? We're trying to identify its domain, its range, all this fun stuff. So what is the domain? Well, where does it exist on the x-axis on my function. Well, I could do my little uh, vertical line test. I could see all of the little spots that it exists on, and I can see that it is, it's gonna exist all the way down here, so it's negative infinity. And this line is gonna keep on increasing, 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 and as it increases, it's going slightly to the right, so that means eventually it's getting to positive infinity. Therefore, my domain is gonna be from negative infinity to positive infinity, or we could call that all real numbers since there's no discontinuities, there's nothing funky happening. What is my range? I could do the same thing. Well, where is it going from? Well, it's starting. Well, what is this number right down here? Well, that's my zero. So that means that my range, oops, my range starts from zero, but where is it going to? Do, 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 do. I follow all the way along and it's going to positive infinity. What about any intercepts? Okay, well, I have a y intercept right here. So that's a is intercept at uh, zero comma one. There are no x intercepts because it's not gonna actually touch. I know it looks like it, but this is an asymptote that it's heading towards. So uh, that means that it's going from zero, or so that's, that means that it's our only intercept is at zero comma one. But what about an asymptote? Well, I just mentioned it. There is definitely one at the x-axis, so that's at y equals zero. That's a horizontal asymptote. But is there any vertical asymptote? Now, a lot of kids might tell me right here, there's a vertical asymptote happening right here. But again, we have to always look at this as the zoomed out version of this graph. So if I zoomed out, what's actually happening in this area up here is that it is slightly going to the right. It is increasing, 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 and it is continuing on to positive infinity. Therefore, it will cross this. And if I zoomed out on my graph, I'd be able to see it. And um, as you're plugging these into a table, when you actually look at that list and spreadsheet, you can identify where that asymptote is going to occur because you start seeing those numbers start approaching that limit. Whereas on the other end, you're just going to see it increase to infinity. Okay, what's my end behavior? Well, I can write that on the left, my limit. So it will always go to negative infinity because this is end behavior. Uh, my function is called f of x. And where is it going? Well, it's going towards zero. What about on the right? Well, that tells me my limit as x goes to positive infinity of f of x. And where is it going? Well, it's going to positive infinity as well. And finally, it's asking where increasing, decreasing occurs. And uh, so that means I just look at it and identify. So what is this function doing? And we read our functions from left to right. If you read it another direction, that might change your increasing, decreasing, which isn't actually standard, which isn't true. So make sure you're reading from left to right. So from left to right, what is this function doing? Well, it's going up and up and up. As x goes to the right, y goes up. Therefore, it's an increasing function everywhere. So I would say it's increasing from negative infinity to positive infinity or on all real numbers. Moving forward. I don't know how to erase this whole page. Ah, there we go. 
me. So that was just a quick self check. If you want to check it, you absolutely can. Okay, but finally, I want you to do this. I want you to take a moment and pause to sketch and analyze three to the X, but I'm gonna help you out. First things first, you're gonna make a table and I've already created a base table for you. So you can use any online um, calculator. I recommend, you know, that we've got Desmos, you've got Mathway, you've got Symbol Lab, you've got a lot of different things. And I know it would be easy to just plug three to the X in, but I really want you to get in this habit right here because what happens if I just give you a table and I don't give you a calculator? What happens in those situations? You need to have the practice of doing this so you don't forget how to do it. Okay, so you're going to plug in these numbers. You're going to use a calculator to get the values. I don't expect you to know 3 to the negative 4, 3 to the negative 2, 3 squared, all of those offhand. But if you do, power to you. Okay, plot those points, connect the dots, and then describe its domain, range, intercepts, asymptotes, and behavior. And I hope you pause here and actually do that. All right, to keep on going, here is that uh, graph. And so let's actually talk about it. Well, where is its domain? Well, it's going from all the way left to all the way right. That means it's from negative infinity to positive infinity. What's its range? Same thing. I look, okay, well, the lowest number it's going to go to is zero. And then to positive infinity, we were looking for intercepts. And look at that. There's one right there. Again, at zero comma one, we got nice and lucky. Um, asymptotes, again, we see one at y equals zero. You can check your data list to kind of see that, but where else could it be? A lot of kids might think right here, but I'm gonna show you a zoomed out version to prove to you that it really does continue out to the right. And behavior, uh, it's gonna be the same. My limit as x approaches negative infinity, I don't know, this was f of x, I think, is going to zero. And my limit as x goes to positive infinity, and as you can tell, and behavior is always x going to negative, negative infinity, it's going to positive infinity. And this one is going to positive infinity. And finally, it is increasing everywhere. So from negative infinity, I don't know what I wrote, to positive infinity. Now let me show you uh, that zoomed out graph. And here it is. And there you can see, um, it clearly does continue on and on and on. And this is zoomed out. This is 3000 up here and it's clearly continuing to infinity. So let's continue on. <laughs> we have transformations of exponents and I'm telling you not to panic because I know it seems like a lot, but remember that these transformations, they follow the same transformations you've been doing since algebra one, the same things we did with linear lines, the same things we did with polynomials, the same things we did with all of our parent functions, we can still do with exponentials. We just have to make sure that all of our information matches. So just a reminder, if you're shifting horizontally, which means to the left and the right, then you have to be within your parameters. Um, same within parameters. If you change that, then, you know, like you're talking about um, horizontal compression. So again, we're talking horizontally. And then finally, down here on the reflection, you can see if you change the reflection of the parameter, you're reflecting over the y-axis. And why did I bring all three of those together? Because I want to remind you with exponents, when you change the parameter, when you actually touch the exponent, then you're changing things on that horizontal. So that might help you to make that three connection. Same with vertically. If you're outside of parameters, then you're actually going up and down. Um, and so if you reflect that, if you're outside parameters, that's a reflection over the x-axis, which is the same direction. It's that vertical. And same if you put a coefficient in front and you have that vertical stretch, that's, if you put it in front, it's vertical. If you put it on the parameter, it's horizontal. So maybe those three connections might help you to realize that within parameters, outside parameters, that's a big deal. So I hope you kind of take a moment, transfer what makes sense to you, make a little cheat sheet, whatever happens, um, trying to figure out this transformation. So I've got a couple here for you. Here we have two to the x plus one. And what's happening with this function? Well, with this function, you have something within parameters. So that means this is a horizontal movement. But where is it horizontally moving? And horizontally, then we're actually going to do what we predict opposite, I guess you would say. So right now, x plus one, a lot of people might predict, okay, horizontal shift, shift left or right, I might shift one to the right. But the reality is, is that you're actually going to be shifting to the left, you're going to do the opposite of what you think. So um, this one is going to shift one unit left. Cool. All right. What about this one? Okay, again, we are within parameters. That is, the negative is next to my x. Therefore, what is happening, it's, a, it's horizontally happening. Therefore, it's a reflection. That means over the y-axis. So this one is reflected over the y-axis. That's all that's happening to this one. Okay, so what about our next one? Ooh, we got a couple things happening here. 
Okay, now we are outside parameters. So that means that's a reflection, but this is over the x-axis. And we have a number here, which tells me that we are uh, shifting at, or compressing. We are expanding or compressing it. But which one am I doing? Well, this is outside parameters again. So that means this is dealing with the vertical. Sorry, I could not spell. Let's try that again. Vertical. Okay. is We're dealing with the vertical compression. Um, sorry, vertical expansion, which is what I believe this is. Let me double check my own little cheat sheet. Yep, so it's going to expand vertically. Cool. Now I've got a couple for you to do, and I hope you pause and check them out. Here's your first one. Can you tell me what these things do? And I'll give you a little hint. There's a negative here, and there's a plus two within parameters. I hope you check this on a calculator. I've got another one for you here. You have a two outside of parameters, and then you have a negative within your parameters. And my final one. Oh, I lied to you. There was only two. Oh, there was a third one. Here it is. It was back. I went too far. So here we have four to the X, but outside parameters, you have minus two. Can you tell me what those did? If you did, then you really understand transformations. You're good to go. But just as a recap, here are some transformations. You know, let's, let's, can you, can you understand what each of these are? And I hope you do pause for a second and you answer each of these, but I'm going to answer them for you. Okay, a shift horizontally left or right, well, that's going to be within your parameters, and you're going to go the opposite direction that you assume. So if it's a plus one, you're going to go to the left. If it's a minus one, you're going to go to the right. Okay, shifting vertically, this is outside parameters. If it's outside parameters plus, then I'm going to go up. If it's outside parameters minus, I'm going to go down. Finally, my vertical stretch and horizontal stretches, well, my vertical one has to be outside parameters because that's matching my shift vertically. And look at that. It is outside parameters. It is the coefficient in front of the base. Okay, if I'm stretching it, if I'm expanding it, it is a whole number or a number greater than one. And if it is um, compressed, then it is a number less than one or one of our little fractions. Same with my horizontal stretch. Well, if it's horizontal, then that has to be within parameters. Okay, so a stretch is going to be a decimal or a fraction, something less than one. And a compression is going to be something bigger. So again, we kind of do the opposite of what we think when we're within parameters. Finally, my reflection. It's outside the parameter, therefore I'm reflecting vertically, therefore it's across the x-axis. I'm with Thin parameters, therefore I'm reflecting horizontally, so that is the y-axis. Finally, we're going to talk about, um, not finally, we still have to talk about some more formulas, but we're going to talk about natural base exponents. Um, something that you may or may not have known is something called the natural base or that irrational number E. E is approximately blah, 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 but really all you have to know is it's approximately 2.71. Just know that, 2.71 or 2.72. Um, but know that it because it is a real number, it, it may be irrational, but it is a, it is a constant. It, it does exist that uh, we can treat E as a constant sometimes, and we use it as a base sometimes. So just know that there's two different ways to treat it. So what does e to the x look like? It looks like that. Well, hey, that really looks like the rest of our exponential functions, right? So then would you guess that its transformations do the same thing? Heck yeah, you should, and they do. So e to the 4x, that is a within parameters, so that it is a expansion or a compression. Um, sorry, expansion or a compression, and since it's within parameters, that means it's horizontal. And that means we're doing the opposite of what we think. So we're actually going to compress horizontally by 4. Finally, we have, or next we have negative x plus 3. So here's a negative within parameters. So that's a horizontal reflection. So it reflects over the y. And then plus 3 is outside. So we're also going to shift it up 3. And then here we have 1 half e to the x. So this is a vertical compression or expansion because it's outside parameters and it is a is a number less than one so that means we're actually compressing it we do what we think it's a small number so finally let's talk about exponential functions and the real world some formulas we actually use so we have the compound interest formula the continuous compound interest formula exponential growth and decay and continuous exponential growth and decay so let me show you what those formulas look like show you what those formulas look like. And here is what the letters stand for. A is the account balance. P is the principal, which means the initial amount you invest in. R is the interest rate, but make sure you put it in decimals. N is the number of times uh, you are compounded per year. And so that's an important letter to know. If it says annually, that's once 
a year. If it says monthly, that's 12 times a year. If it says daily, that's 365 times a year. And T is time, the number of years you actually let it sit in the account and gain um, interest. Finally, we have exponential growth and decay as well as continuous exponential growth and decay. We like to use these equations for populations or things like that. Um, and so here we have two equations and some information about those variables. N is going to be your final amount, like what ends up happening, just like A is your end account balance. Um, but N naught is your initial quantity. R or K is your exponential rate and T is time. But one thing I want you to kind of notice here is that what's happening, what's different between these two, in, these two formulas up top and down bottom? Well, when they are continuous, what natural base are we using now? We are using natural base E. So that's the big, big, big difference there. So I've got a couple examples for you. I'm going to fill out the equations and give you the answers, but I hope you see how simple it is to just pull this information. So Christy invests $300 into an account and she has an interest rate of 6%, making no other deposits or withdrawals. What will Chris's account balance be after 20 years if the interest is compounded? Semi-annually, monthly, and daily. So first of all, what information do we have? We have our principal because she invested in an original $300. We have our interest rate, but remember we convert it back to decimals, so 0 0.06. She doesn't withdraw our deposit, so I have, can just do this standard. And what will her account be after 20 years? Okay, so that means time is 20 years. But what is my N? Okay, here, my N changes three different times. So does that mean we're doing three different equations? Heck yeah, it does. So semi-annually means two times a year. Monthly means 12 times a year. And daily is going to mean 365. So let's see what those equations would look like. What if it was semi-annually? Then it would be equal to my principal plus... Hold on, I want to get my end answer up here with my calculator. So my principal, not plus, my bad. Get the right equation going down. It's not my PERT formula. Okay, my principal times 1, which is standard, plus R over N to the power NT. Okay, so let's get our semi-annually. My account's going to be equal to $300 times 1 plus 0 0.06 over 2 to the power 2 times 20. That's it. It's as simple as that. And what does this equal? It equals $978.61. What about monthly? Could you figure out that equation? What's the only part that's going to change? If you guess the N, you are absolutely correct. So my account would be equal to 300 times 1 plus 0 0.06. None of that's changing. Now my N is going to change to 12. My N up here is going to change to 12. And what does this equal? This equals $993.06. And finally, if we compound it daily, so 300 chain doesn't change, my 0 0.06 doesn't change, but this number right here is going to change, and so is this. And what does this one equal? It equals $995.94. So I want you to take a moment and look at this and really think about this. Does the the compounding really change or affect what's happening? I mean, it does. It absolutely does change um, the price. Obviously, my end account, if it's daily, if it's daily compound, it's going to be higher than my end account if it's semi annually. But Make sure you understand what these mean in the real world. If you're going to go to, if you're looking at real financial investments, do your research before looking at it. Don't just simply say, you know, oh, in pre-cal, I learned that a, a daily compound was much better than a semi-annual. Do your true research and find out the truth about all of these things and what's the best option for you. Anyway, let's move on. So it was easy peasy, right? Lemon squeezy. So simple. So let's work on our next question. Now, this looks like the same question, except what does it say? It says that the interest rate is compounded continuously, which means that I no longer have an N. And in fact, my formula is called the PERT formula. So I still know that my principal is $300. I still know that my rate is 0.06%. And I still know time is 20, but I no longer have an N. So I simply say my account is equal to 300 E to the 0 0.06 times 20. And what does that equal? That equals $996 and four cents. And if we compare that back to our previous, um, where we were compounding daily, I think, the daily compound was 995 and some change. Um, and so that tells you that technically a continuous 
a continuously compounded um, interest rate account would have the better investment because it would be slightly higher. Now, if we're talking big, big numbers, this might be a big deal, but might be a big difference for you. So these are, again, things to think about if you're ever considering investing or interested in your financial future. Finally, we have a population problem. Mexico is a population of approximately 100 million. If Mexico's population continues to grow at the prescribed rate, then what would my population be in 10 years or in 20 years? And here are the two different rates we have. So I'm going to go ahead and write down my original formulas. Uh, because I want to make sure we get this right. So here is my traditional formula for this one up top, n equals n naught times 1 plus r to the t. And our continuous formula is going to be n equals n naught e to the kt. Okay, so here we have time in two different prospects. So we have an, an n naught of 100 million. We also have time of 10 as well as time of 20 to account for. And we have a rate or a K or a K e or a K, whichever one um, we're using for our equation of 0 0.0142 because that is our rate. Okay. Now let's do our first equation right here. So my N is going to be equal to 100 million times 1 plus 0 0.0142. 2 to the 10th, and we're also going to do one at 100 million times 1 plus 0 0.0142 to the 20th. And this one is going to be um, approximately, it's a big, big number. 1, 2, 6, 6, 5, 6, 8, 6, 9. And this one is approximately 1, 4, 5, 8, 3, 6, 0, 2, 2. Okay, so these are big, big numbers, and these are our predicted millions of people, right? Or I guess it's not millions. That would imply this is a significantly larger number, just blah of people. That's our predicted population. But what happens when the rate actually grows continuously? Instead of growing at the prescribed 1.42 percent annually, it's continuously growing. So here's our equation. It would be equal to 100 million e to the 0 0.0142 times 10. And then our other one would be equal to 100 million e to the 0 0.0142 times 20. And what do these approximately equal? And that's 1,000 or 100, 226 bill, million, 783. Ooh. Wow, I lost all my stuff. <laughs> but that's okay. I can keep going. So what were those? That was 126, 783, 431. And obviously my pen doesn't want to work with us today. I'm real sorry about that. Okay. So in essence, that's what you would be doing. You would be creating those equations, using the information in the word problem, pulling that info and plugging it in. These equations are super simplistic. Do you think that I'm going to ask that you memorize these four? Absolutely. Please be ready for that. So for some closure, just remember the things that we talked about were key features of graphs. Um, we really focused on domain, range, intercepts, asymptotes, increasing, decreasing, and, and behavior. Um, how, do I, how do we graph exponents? And in fact, in our next video, we're going to actually watch about how to graph the logs. It's the same thing. You start with the table. It's as simple as that. Then you plot those points, connect the dots, and now you can actually identify your key features. Then we talked about transformations. We also found out what a natural base was, and we got to apply them in our real-world formulas, which are four formulas that I know you're going to memorize. I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.